Hello and welcome back to the Crime Reel. Today on the Crime Reel we shall be visiting Hertfordshire in England to look at the life and crimes of Graham Frederick Young. As is so often the case with true crime stories, Graham's start in life was not a good one. He was born on 7th of September 1947 in Neasden in Middlesex. Whilst his mother Bessie Young was pregnant with Graham, she developed pleurisy and died of tuberculosis when Graham was just three months old. His father, Fred Young, was devastated by her death and felt unable to care for the newborn Graham and his elder sister Winifred, who was eight. The family were separated. Graham was sent to live with his aunt and uncle, Winnie and Jack. Meanwhile, his sister was taken in by their grandparents and their father, Fred, lived alone. For the first two years of his life, Graham was raised by his aunt and uncle. But in 1950, his father remarried and decided to reunite his family. Fred, along with his new wife Molly and the kids Graham and Winifred, set up home together in St Albans. Graham was unsettled and distressed at this change, as he was being removed from the only parents he had ever known. Graham grew into an unusual child. He was a loner with very few friends. Other children his age were reluctant to forge relationships with him as they felt uncomfortable in his presence. When he became old enough to read, he chose some very unlikely heroes. He immersed himself in detailed accounts of murders with Dr. Crippin, the Victorian doctor who poisoned his wife being a particular favourite. He developed an unhealthy obsession and respect for Adolf Hitler with the devastation of World War II still very much at the forefront of people's minds, this only served to isolate him further. He was a bright child, having passed the 11 plus, a selective test to allow the most academic pupils to be placed into grammar schools within England. However, at school, he showed little interest and made no effort in any subject with the exception of chemistry, particularly toxicology. The limited school curriculum on these subjects led to him spending multiple hours at the library researching them in further detail. His father encouraged his love of science by buying him a chemistry set, something which he also became assessed with. Through his love of chemistry, he bonded with another boy who was also fascinated by the subject, Christopher Williams, a neighbour of the Young family and Graham soon became firm friends, travelling to school and eating lunch together. Shortly afterwards, Christopher started to suffer with stomach pain, sickness and headaches on a regular basis. Due to the regularity of these symptoms, Christopher's mother began to question if he was simply trying to avoid school, but took him to visit a doctor where he was diagnosed with migraines. It was never even considered that Christopher may have been poisoned. With his extensive knowledge of poisons and toxicology, 13-year-old Graham was able to convince two separate local chemists that he was in fact 17 years old. This enabled him, under the excuse of studying, to obtain the poisons antimony, arsenic, thallium and digitalis. Graham had been slowly poisoning Christopher whilst acting as a concerned friend. He would visit Christopher as often as possible in order to track the progress of Christopher's illness. However, with Christopher regularly absent from school and only so many times that he could visit, Graham became increasingly frustrated that he was unable to observe the full effects of the poison which he was administering. This led him to focus on people where he could have unlimited access his own family. Starting with his stepmother, Molly, Graham started poisoning those close to him. Molly suffered from excruciating stomach pains with vomiting and diarrhoea. Before long, his father, Fred, was suffering with similar symptoms. Then his sister, Winifred, and finally Graham himself, all had similar attacks of pain, sickness and diarrhoea. 
It would seem as though there was a mystery bug affecting the entire household which would never quite leave. With no logical reason for the repeated illnesses, Fred became worried that Graham may have been inadvertently hurting the family with his careless use of chemicals. It never occurred to anyone that this could be deliberate, particularly in view of the fact that Graham himself had been ill as well. However, while Fred, Winifred and Graham's symptoms would come and go, Molly's became progressively worse. She started to suffer with severely bad back pains, her hair began to fall out, and she lost a lot of weight. Graham was slowly poisoning her with antimony, but was becoming impatient that she had not yet died. So more than a year after he had started poisoning his family, Graham decided upon a different, more radical approach. On the evening of April the 20th, 1962, Graham spiked Molly's evening meal with a heavy metal substance known as thallium. It would have been impossible for Molly to notice this colourless, tasteless, odourless chemical. On April 21st, 1962, Molly woke up with different symptoms to usual. She had a stiff neck and was suffering with pins and needles in her hands and feet. Despite feeling incredibly ill, she persevered with her daily routine. But when Fred returned home that day, he found her collapsed in the garden, writhing in agony. Graham was simply watching her. Molly was rushed to hospital, where she died later that evening. Her cause of death was put down to a prolapse of a spinal bone and she was soon cremated. A prolapsed bone at the top of the spine is one of the known symptoms of long-term antimony poisoning, but there was no reason to consider this at the time. After Molly's death, the illnesses within the family continued. Graham's uncle John, who had taken him in as a baby, became violently ill after Molly's funeral. Fred's symptoms had always been sporadic during Molly's illness, but after she died, he became increasingly ill. He was soon admitted to hospital where it came to light that his condition often worsened on a Monday after his and Graham's weekly trip to the local pub on Sundays. Doctors soon began to suspect antimony poisoning and when this was confirmed it was noted that just one more dose would probably have killed Fred. Whilst the thought of a 14 year old boy slowly poisoning his family members was too difficult to bear. Jeffrey Hughes, Graham's science teacher, was becoming suspicious. He searched Graham's desk and found several bottles of poison, as well as details of famous poisoners and drawings of dying men. He reported his concerns to the school's head teacher, and they in turn contacted the police. On 23rd of May 1962, Graham was arrested and confessed to the attempted murders of his father, sister and friend Christopher. As Molly had been cremated at Graham's suggestion, it was impossible to analyse her remains, so he was not held accountable for her murder. He was assessed by two psychiatrists who diagnosed a personality disorder and schizophrenia and was detained under the Mental Health Act in Broadmoor Hospital. He was the youngest inmate in nearly 80 years. The original sentencing stated that he should be detained for a minimum of 15 years. However, in June 1970, the prison psychiatrist recommended his release, stating that Graham was no longer obsessed with poisons, violence and mischief. He had served just nine years. During his time in Broadmoor, Graham had in fact spent a lot of time studying medical texts and extending his knowledge of various poisons. He continued to experiment on inmates and staff and it is believed that he was able to extract cyanide from bushes in the hospital grounds that he used to murder a fellow inmate. It is also reported that shortly before his release, he told one of the nurses that he was going to kill one person for every year that he had spent in Broadmoor. Despite this comment being recorded at the time, Graham was still released and deemed to be no longer a danger. Upon his release, Graham was greeted by his sister Winifred and her husband Dennis. Winifred was keen to believe that her brother had made a full recovery although their father refused to forgive him 
for the death of his wife Molly and the long-term effects he had suffered as a result of his poisoning. Despite the fact that the hospital had labelled him as cured, Graham continued to be obsessed with his past crimes. He visited the chemist where he had originally obtained his poisons and his old family home in Neesden and seemed far more concerned with being recognised for his crimes than to show those who knew him that he was in fact a reformed man. Shortly after his release, Graham moved to a hostel and began working in nearby Slough. It was at this hostel that Graham met 34-year-old Trevor Sparks. Trevor soon began suffering extreme stomach pain and sickness. His symptoms continued to worsen and he was eventually hospitalised where doctors failed to diagnose his illness. He continued to feel extreme pain for years afterwards. It is also rumoured that another man who was befriended by Graham developed an illness with such excruciating pain that he took his own life. A formal connection with Graham has however never been made. Graham found a job working as a storeman at Hadlands, a photographic supply company in Bovingdon. His new employers were made aware of his criminal past and Broadmoor stay but were not provided with any details. They had no idea that he had a history of poisoning. Graham happily accepted the role of making tea and coffee for his workmates. Soon, Graham's 59-year-old boss, Bob Eggle, fell ill. He experienced severe cramps and dizziness, which was initially thought to be the Bovingdon bug, a virus that had recently struck a number of local school children. Other workers complained of similar symptoms but always seemed to recover when off of work and then instantly became sicker whenever they had returned. Bob was admitted to hospital in June 1971 and just 10 days later, on July 7th, 1971, he died. He was in extreme pain at the end of his life, but no one suspected poisoning. His cause of death was recorded as pneumonia. Over the next couple of months, Graham went on to poison seven more people, using different doses of different poisons among his colleagues. Graham hoped to avoid anyone making a link between his various symptoms. In September 1971, one of the employees, Fred Biggs' condition became so bad that his health deteriorated to the point where his skin started to peel off of his body. Even the slightest touch resulted in agonizing pain. After suffering excruciating pain for several weeks, Fred Biggs died on 19th of November 1971. With two employee deaths in a short amount of time, a meeting was called with the management and staff at the company. The company doctor spoke at the meeting and confirmed that there was no water, radioactive or heavy metal contamination. During the meeting, Graham questioned the doctor's information, stating that the symptoms suffered by the employees were consistent with thallium poisoning. After the meeting, he then spoke at length with the company doctor, boasting about his knowledge of toxicology. This knowledge and interest raised suspicion amongst Graham's colleagues who informed the police. With the police involved, the details of Graham's criminal past soon came to light. A search of Graham's room uncovered walls covered with pictures of Hitler, bottles of poison, disturbing drawings of people in various states of poisoning, and a diary containing the details of those he had poisoned along with a progression of their symptoms. On Saturday 21st of November 1971, Graham was visiting his father and Aunt Winnie in Sheerness, Kent. The police arrived late in the evening to arrest Graham. When he was arrested, he had a fatal dose of thallium in his pocket, something which he referred to as his exit dose. When questioned, Graham admitted verbally to the poisonings of his work colleagues and boasted about his perfect murder of his stepmother years before. However, he refused to sign a written admission of guilt, knowing that he could deny all charges when the case came to court. Graham loved the media hype surrounding the case and played up to his sinister image in order to unnerve the jury. The press gave him the nickname, the Teacup Poisoner. 
The trial began on 19th of June 1972 in St Albans Court. Graham pleaded not guilty and claimed that his diary was a fantasy for a novel which he was writing. He felt confident that he would not be found guilty as his previous conviction was not allowed to be entered into evidence. His arrogance over his superior intelligence made him believe that he would get away with his crimes. One thing he had not accounted for were the improvements to forensic science in the years since Molly's murder. Despite Bob and Fred being cremated, the prosecution were still able to prove that they had both been poisoned with thallium. Ten days later, on the 29th of June 1972, Graham was found guilty of two counts of murder, two counts of attempted murder, and two counts of administering poison. He was given four life sentences. After the guilty verdict, details of Graham's previous crimes were revealed. A visibly shaken jury realised that if their verdict, which was by no means a foregone conclusion, had gone slightly differently, this highly dangerous man could easily have been back on the streets. Graham was imprisoned in the maximum security Pankhurst prison on the Isle of Wight after serving 18 years of his sentence. On the 1st of August 1990, he died at the age of 42. The official cause of death was heart failure, but speculation remains as to whether Graham found an ingenious way to poison himself in his final act of control. That concludes the story of the teacup poisoner, Graham Young. I hope you found that story interesting. Once again, thank you for your continued support. I'll be interested in seeing what comments you leave on this story. Thank you once again for listening to The Crime Reel. Goodbye. If you're still listening, try and put Forgotten Lives in the comments. I will also put a link in the description because his channel is so interesting. Please go to his channel. Thanks once again, everyone. Goodbye.